um, Amy comes to us um, after having been the executive director of Project Healthy Children, an NGO in Boston, which actually worked with fortification of micronutrients in many developing countries. Um, she has an interesting uh, background before that because she was also the director of uh, pediatric HIV for the Clinton Foundation and the deputy director uh, for the country of India. Um, and prior to that, she got some training at Northwestern with an BS uh, in communication studies and MS in integrated marketing. And she's a Stanford graduate of our business school, MBA. So she's going to talk to us. I asked her if she could tell us a little bit about uh, micronutrient fortification, because that was one of her passions before coming to Stanford. So thanks, Amy. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? First of all, a little bit more explanation about why I'm here and why I'm telling you about micronutrient malnutrition. Um, it's clear, I'm not a doctor. Um, I don't even play one on TV. Um, but I do know a lot about this one particular issue, and so we'll talk about what the problem is, talk a little bit about some of the solutions to it, and then specifically get into fortification. Um, I have a couple of things I'd like to admit, but before I do that, I just want to understand who's here. So of the folks here, who has been in a developing country or resource-constrained setting outside of the U.S.? Okay, most people. Um, of that group, who's practiced clinically or been in a clinical setting in those places? Okay, about half us. Great. Um, so here's a, a little bit of um, <laughs> should, telling something important about me. I, my first real introduction to global health was as a strategy consultant. I worked for a big strategy firm doing a lot of business type stuff. And um, one day I was asked to be on a project that was for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The only reason I was asked to be on this project is because I had done a lot of international work. Most of that had been flying around on fancy planes, sitting in business class, and telling folks what to do about airplane branding. But they needed to find somebody who they could send to Vietnam the next day. And that was me, because they figured I could find my way there. Um, and so I found myself at a UN subcommittee meeting for nutrition, and a bunch of folks talking about what they were going to do about these big issues of nutrition. And this was in 1999. Um, that meeting was one of the most eye-glazing, boring meetings I have ever been to in my entire life. And I couldn't believe that they had sent me all the way to Vietnam on a business class ticket that I bought the day before yesterday to get there and listen to these people talk about what the solution was for nutrition. Because guess what? The big solution was food. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and as a 20-something really arrogant consultant, like most of us are, um, I thought, this is ridiculous. And I spent the next three to six months working on this project for the Gates Foundation, which was to develop a private-public partnership to address micronutrient malnutrition. And during that period of time, I traveled all over the world. Um, it got more exciting than me just getting to go to Vietnam. I had to fly directly from Zambia to Guatemala, which is not a direct flight. Um, I had a meeting with the CEO of a major sugar conglomerate in Latin America, and I offended him, which was a great move in the project. Um, and I vowed after this that I would never, ever work on global health again. I was done. I was completely done. Um, but I eventually ended up coming back to it. And it's because I find these problems to be the most interesting problems there are in the world. And they're interesting from a clinical perspective that um, I'm sure you all are interested in. But as a non-clinical person, I think they're also interesting from a program management and a policy development perspective. And so that's what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today. Fortunately, I have some plants in the audience, so if there are questions about some of the clinical stuff, we can definitely get into those as well. Um, so with that, let's start talking about malnutrition and hunger. Um, not surprising. Hunger is something that is a really big issue. A billion people or a billion children in the world are malnourished, and there are both the short-term effects, which are really focused on the individual, and the longer-term effects that have an individual issue as well as a societal impact. Um, and those things get us into not just how big one grows or how smart one gets, but what you're able to do as a human on this planet and produce, and what that means for your city, your country, and your continent about what um, economic productivity you're allowed to have. Malnutrition also comes in many forms. Um, which person on this page isn't malnourished? Anybody have a clue? Yeah, all of them, including me. Yeah. 
Um, last week, I was diagnosed by Dr. Kache as being anemic. Um, I've been anemic my whole life. Um, this is not why I work on micronutrient malnutrition. It just happens to be true. And I'm pretty sure that I am not the only person in this room that has some form of malnutrition. Um, I'm pretty sure at least one other person does, although for HIPAA reasons, I don't want anybody to reveal that. But when you're in the developing world, you see issues of malnutrition in a much more stark way. Um, the two ways that you generally see it are from Erasmus or Quashicor, Quash. Um, they're two diff very, very different forms. You see both of them in dramatic ways all the time. For those of you who have spent time in clinical settings, this is something that probably every child that you see is experiencing in some way. Um, two different versions of malnutrition. Marasmus is when you don't get enough nutrition in general. Um, so it's the extreme thinning. You start seeing the differentiated pigmentation in the skin. Um, and it really mostly affects infants and very, very young children. Quash is when you don't get enough protein. And so um, this is one that really befuddles those of us who aren't clinicians because you see these little plump kids and you think, how are they malnourished? You know, for, for the outside eye, that's a, that's a confusing thing. That really has to do with not getting enough protein. And so one of the things that it's known for is being a disease of the first, second child. So once a child is weaned too early because the mother has become pregnant again, that child isn't breastfeeding, it's not getting enough protein, and it ends up in a downward spiral. Anytime you see one of these forms of malnutrition, you're also probably seeing micronutrient malnutrition. Um, this is not because of the quantity of food that people are getting, but it's because of the quality of food. And so the issues of this um, are, are really severe, but it's not something that we talk about that much, and it's not something that we see that often because it's really underlying a lot of other diseases um, and a lot of another, other issues. Um, and it has some pretty big economic impacts. Um, we know that, that this is about 20% of the population on the planet that's, that's dealing with micronutrient malnutrition. It can be a reduction of 6% of GDP for a country. Um, WHO has done some pretty fancy calculations to get there. And a lot of the time, the deficiencies won't go detected because you don't see them. Um, you are, you're treating the, um, the disease that is on top of it, and you're not treating the underlying thing. And it's difficult to treat, right? But food might sound like it's an easy thing to provide somebody, but when you're in a resource-constrained setting, we know food is a big deal. Now, I've talked a lot about the economic stuff of this, and I know that seems um, a little bit cold, but I have to say that when dealing with people and talking about this particular issue and, and having someone be able to say the solution is so simple, it's so simple and so complicated. Um, and oftentimes, I've found myself needing to make the argument as to why you should focus on this. Why micronutrient malnutrition? malnutrition? You know, if, why don't we just focus on nutrition, give people food? Well, the next argument is, why would you deal with nutrition? Why not deal with the disease? Why not treat people who are already sick? Which can lead you to the next question is, why, why deal with people that are sick? Why not make sure that they have a safe house or clean water or somewhere to live or a job? Or why don't you make sure that the government isn't corrupt? So it's like those Russian dolls, right? Like everything builds upon another. And so a lot of the things that I'll talk about have to do with these bigger issues. But fundamentally, if we don't address the micronutrient deficiencies, you end up with really serious issues like neural tube defects, like blindness, like goiter. And as we talk about micronutrient malnutrition, it really does apply to all the vitamins and minerals. But there are five that we generally, in this, the industry of nutrition, bring up all the time. Vitamin A, iron, iodine, um, folic acid, and zinc. The other big ones that you're starting to hear more and more about are selenium and the B vitamins and vitamin D. I'm not going to talk about those today, and I'm not even really going to talk that much about these in detail, because there's a lot of information um, that you can find about it. Um, but I will say that one of the confusing things that I found in this is why we break it up into addressing each one of these vitamins. Now, just like I said, if you find a child who is protein malnourished, they're also probably micronutrient malnourished. If you find a child that doesn't get enough iron, chances are they're not getting enough of something else too. Right? It's, it's not like we eat this way and say, I, I'm going to have that piece of lettuce because I know it's iron. Well, I've been trying to do a little bit more of that, but that's not the way that we generally eat. But it is the way that the industry has been organized. And I think that's because we mimicked in nutrition the way that the broader global health community had organized around specific diseases. We're starting to see in this group, just as we are in um, global health organizations that had focused on just one disease, 
that you need to broaden out. And so these groups are starting to work closer and closer together and not being so focused on their particular deficiency, but in looking at multiple micronutrient um, interventions. So that might be how we're starting to move, but since in the past it has been broken out this way, the next five slides I'm going to show are per nutrient because that's the way that the data comes. So vitamin A deficiency. Um, this is one of the big first ones, um, as we have seen already, that the, the biggest um, feature of it is really around eyesight and blindness. Um, it also has a big impact on immune function. And so vitamin A deficiency is often underlying when you see malaria and measles and diarrhea. And so um, it's something that you need to address in all these, these cases. Now, this is not a particularly stark map. As you look at this and you think, like, where are the big diseases and what's a big problem, this actually looks pretty good. And that's because in lots of countries there are vitamin A supplementation programs. Um, you can get supplements of vitamin A once or twice a year, and that covers most of what you need, and it's very easy to, to deliver in the form of a supplement. Those programs go along with childhood immunization, and so it's a relatively easy thing to deliver. And so we've done a pretty good job at dealing with the deficiency. You do see a couple of the pink countries, and those are generally places where the health systems aren't in such good shape, and so it's really difficult to do that delivery, and so you see the deficiencies coming through. My favorite, the iron deficient anemia, much bigger issue. Clearly, I'm not alone because in the US, we're still seeing a lot of anemia. Um, and there are some direct impacts on, um, on um, mortality, especially in the maternal, maternal and perinatal stages. But bigger issues are the more systematic things around what people are able to do and learn because of how energetic and uh, able to pay attention they are. Um, so there are a lot of things that from a societal impact really have um, some big things to think about. Just consider if kids aren't able to pay attention in school to learn, if people aren't able to produce while they're at work, um, or if the cognitive fun function of the base member of society is lowered, what does that mean for the overall country? Iodine deficiency is probably the first one that, that anybody ever really dealt with. And again, we're starting to see that this looks pretty good in the places where it's good, and it looks really bad in the places where it's bad. It's kind of an interesting map to see that you know, it's mostly white, um, and then it's low in the really high. We don't see a lot of stuff in the middle. And that's because iodine is this weird mineral that you mostly get through vegetables, and they seep it up through the soil. Well, over the history of the world, the soils become depleted in iodine. The iodine flows out of the soil into the ocean, and that means that most vitamins don't have enough iodine in them which is why every single person in this room eats iodine through salt. Um, if you buy salt in the store, if you eat salt in anything that you eat in the US, it is iodized. And that is one of two ways that anybody can get iodine in places where there's not enough of it in the soil. The only other way is through supplementation. Now, if you're feeling like you're iodine deficient and you start feeling that goiter coming on, um, one of two things, start eating some more shellfish because that's where the iodine has gone, to the bottom of the ocean. Shellfish, pick that up. Or um, make sure that you aren't eating too much salt because goiter is also the symptom that you get if you have too much iodine in your system. Zinc deficiency um, is one that we don't know quite as much about. So the industry knows that zinc deficiency comes along with just nutrition in general. And so this slide that we're seeing really is an indirect measure of where there's zinc deficiency based on stunting. Um, for no particular reason, there's just not been a lot of data collected about this one particular um, deficiency, but we know that there are some pretty big effects of it, again, with growth rate and immunity. Um, and that's why zinc is now being put in a lot of the ORS solutions so that when children have diarrhea, you're treating them not just with the solution to get them hydrated, but also with zinc to work on their immunity. Folic acid, even worse, we have no map to know where this is happening. Um, and the only way that we're able to see where the effects are is by doing a, a sense of where the neural tube defects are. Now, folic acid deficiency also can lead to anemia, but the big thing that we worry about from a micronutrient malnutrition perspective is the neural tube defect. It's not a large number of people that are affected, but it's such a severe thing that happens. Um, it's something that we really want to avoid. It is, it's a severe thing at the individual level. It's also a severe thing at a societal level because the cost of treating a child that has spina bifida is really big on a, on a um, per person basis. And so it's actually still an economic, good economic argument to address folic acid. 
The big place where folic acid is needed is during the first trimester. And so a lot of the stuff that you'll see around now is about focusing on women of childbearing age or women who want to get pregnant. Well, that's great for here, but in places where pregnancies aren't planned and there's not a lot of antenatal care, you really need to make sure that folks are getting what they need even without changing any of their behavior. Strangely, there's even a birth control pill that is now fortified with folic acid, which I find to be one of the most odd things I've ever seen. Um, so, how do we prevent all of this? What do we do? It's, it's food. Um, it is really food. Um, and the reason I keep coming back to that is when I started working at Project Healthy Children, I, um, I'd been doing some work for Partners in Health, and I had a conversation with Paul Farmer about why I was going to work on this one small issue. And he literally shook me and was like, Amy, it's just food. Just get them food. And it's totally true, but it's more complicated than that. And Partners in Health does a good job of getting people food in some cases, but they haven't done as good of a job of thinking about how to get them the right mix of food. And that's because this is complicated. You know, a lot of times you talk to people who don't want to have really serious um, interventions, and they'll say, okay, so fine, it's about a balanced diet. You don't have to do anything, just get people to eat right. So think about yesterday. Who in this room ate a balanced diet? Oh my gosh, one, two people. Wow, I really thought it would be higher than that. <laughs> um, so here's the next question. Who, who took a vitamin supplement yesterday? Fantastic, still really crappy numbers. Um, and I already gave you the answer to this one, but who ate any food that was fortified? No, seriously, everybody's hand should be up. Um, so of these things, if we think the answer to this problem is food and you just have to eat a balanced diet, and this group of doctors, only two people, ate a balanced diet yesterday, tell me that that's a good argument to tell somebody who has to walk three miles to the health clinic, who has to spend four hours getting water. Eating a balanced diet is really hard to do. And it's really unfair to think that if it's hard for us to do, it's a good answer for what other folks should be doing. Supplementation is also a great answer, but you forget to take the pill. Right? We all forget to take the pill. Adherence is really hard. Add on top of that that there's not a Walgreens to go buy it, you don't have money in your pocket to pay for it, and you've got a, a group of children that you've got to buy many, many of them for, and you can't rely on the supply chain that those things are going to even be there. Supplementation starts to become a really hard argument as well. And that's why fortification is a, an attractive option. Fortification is attractive because it doesn't require that anybody change their behavior. Just eat what you're going to eat. I'm going to worry about making sure that what you're eating has good stuff in it for you. Now, I know I've just made that really simple, and there's a lot more to it, and we can get to that. But that's the reason that we focus on fortification. Many of the foods that we eat every day are fortified. So you guys didn't raise your hand, but how many of you yesterday ate that? That? Are you not eating at all? <laughs> that? Anything with that in it? How about bread? Somebody ate bread yesterday. <laughs> Cereal? That might be the only thing you ate? No. Nope. Margarine? Rice. OK, so nobody had the tang, but right, tang? And my favorite, Coke. We fortify everything here. I defy you to go to the grocery store when apparently you get a moment to go to the grocery store and look and see any food that isn't fortified. Now, the soda isn't fortified today. I looked at that. Some of the times it is. But really, so many of the foods that we have in the U.S. are fortified. And that's because we've been fortifying here since the 1920s. The 1920s is when we started putting iodine in salt, and that was to address a big issue of goiter. Yes, in the U.S. we had goiter. Um, by the 1930s, we had added vitamin D to milk because there were a big issue with rickets in Michigan. I don't know why Michigan was the ricket capital of the world, but apparently it was in the U.S. for a while. Um, by the 1940s, we started adding all the B vitamins and iron to flour, and over 75% of the breads that were being made were fortified by, I guess it was 42. We took a little bit of a break, um, but then calcium became a big deal in the 1980s. And then we started moving into folic acid in the 90s. So this is something that's been going on in the US for a long time. Interestingly, and importantly coming up soon, it's on a voluntary basis. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why it started that way, but it's an important note, and we'll talk about why in a few minutes. So again, I'm back to my economics. Why fortification? Well, it's cheap. 
really truly it costs less than a dollar per person per year for all of the micronutrients at least all five of the ones that we talked about that's a pretty good deal there's not much that you get for a dollar per person per year that can have a really big impact on health and if I think about some of my uh, the inputs from the Copenhagen consensus which is a big group of nerdy economists that get together every five or ten years and think about what are the big interventions that we can have that will alleviate poverty or have an impact on the world this is the best ROI for every dollar that you spend we can make seventeen dollars well how do you do that so it's a dollar per person per year so I'm fortifying all the food I get money back because people are more productive um, I don't have to spend as much money dealing with their illnesses and the overall system isn't as burdened. That seems like a really good deal. It can prevent these losses of up to 6% in GDP. I don't know who doesn't like that. But the important thing on this is that it's meant to complement other things. So fortification alone isn't a good idea. It's a good idea within all of this, but you have to also be educating people. You do have folks that you need to provide supplements for, and it's always good that we continue to hear about these balanced diets, even if people in this room aren't following them. Just to keep it complicated, there are a lot of forms of fortification. There's biofortification, there, which is by adding the nutrients in at the seed level and then letting the plants grow and having them have a better profile. There's commercial fortification, which is what I talked about, about adding the nutrients at the industry level, mixing it all up, putting it in packages and letting you buy it. And then there's home fortification. Um, home fortification is adding sprinkles, which I actually brought some of. Apparently, I don't want these back. I'd like you guys to eat them since you're not getting enough of these things. Um, home fortification is a little bit controversial being known as fortification because it's actually more like supplementation. And that's because the, there are these packets. They basically are a powder. And instead of taking it as a pill, you get it mixed in with the bowl. And, and we still rely on the mother and the bowl instead of the person and the pill. But um, it's removing at least one layer. Biofortification, I'm sure somebody here doesn't like this because of GMOs. Um, Biofortification doesn't have to be associated with genetically modified foods. It is in a lot of cases, but there's also just selecting best seeds, selecting the best crops with the highest, um, the highest output of vitamins and minerals. A really big one that we've been hearing a lot about lately is the vitamin A fortified um, orange fleshed sweet potato. Um, there's a lot of good work that's happening with that. It's slow. We're not entirely sure what's going to happen with it. We haven't seen a lot of data about how well it works. There's golden rice, um, which has issues in people accepting it because it is truly that yellow, um, but also a pretty good product. The thing that we do know works, because we've seen it work in all sorts of countries, is just by having something that's labeled the same way and putting some vitamins in it. Before I go too much further, I'm going to admit what the criticism, criticisms of fortification are, um, just to get them out of the way. It took me a really long time in, to understand this, and so please let me know if it doesn't make sense. But fortification will not solve the entire problem, because I have to, I have to remember that I have to just work in averages. So when I'm creating all the flour for all of the people in this room, I have to think about what is the average amount of flour that you eat today and how does that compare with how much you eat and balance it out I also have to think about how much you eat today versus how much you eat tomorrow and balance that out so it's averages of averages which means that I have a very low level that I could put in in order for it to be safe most of the vitamins and minerals there aren't that many issues with toxicity but you still have to be thinking about it considering it and so you can't really address the entire deficiency you can really just address the edges of it. But it's better to address some of it than, than none of it. And that's why it needs to work with other things. I talked about the toxicity a little bit. So it's something that you have to keep an eye out for. And this is particularly important because one of the things that we have to do in this is rely on industry. And this often in the, in the global health community will make people uncomfortable. Because we're not talking about doing a health intervention where we've got doctors running out and giving supplements. We're actually working with a food producer and we are trusting them to add something to the food at a right level and to monitor to make sure that it is, um, it's a safe level that they're going in, that the vitamins haven't gone rancid, and that they're storing them in, a right, in the right way. All of these things food producers are actually really well positioned to do. They do it with the food. But when you trust them to do it in a global health setting, that sometimes gets people uncomfortable. You can address this with having proper, proper monitoring. 
but monitoring costs money. Um, you have to have somebody who's able to go out and make sure that these things are happening. So it's important um, to think about how that plays into this whole issue. And the other really big thing is while the costs are low, there are some folks that will argue industry is going to just pass this on to consumers, then consumers are paying more, and isn't that a problem? They're not going to get as much food. Well, if it's a dollar per person per year, and you divide that across all of the kilograms of all of the flour and sugar and salt and oil that somebody's going to eat, and you think about the volatility of food prices, literally no one will notice. You can also offset that by putting in some incentives. So incentives to lower the cost around the importation tax of how much it costs to bring the vitamins and minerals in, or how much it costs to bring in that machinery, or not, by not charging to have them be monitored. So there's some ways around this cost issue, but it is something that comes up. <coughs> there are a lot of groups that work on this. There had been even more, um, but this is where things have, have sort of netted out. And that organization that I worked on for the Gates Foundation turned into this thing called GAIN. So I eventually, after saying I was never, ever going to do this, um, got a call after spending a couple of years at the Clinton Foundation living in India from a group saying that they were looking for an executive director to run this thing on micronutrient malnutrition. And I just thought that the irony of that was too much. Um, that, and honestly, I wanted to move back from India. And so I took this role um, running Project Healthy Children, which is an NGO based in Boston. Um, it was started by a couple of Stanford MBA grads from the 80s. And they were focused on trying to put in place national fortification programs. When I joined, we had a program in Rwanda and one in Honduras, and neither one had gotten very far. And so um, I started to learn a lot about what these things needed to look like and what were the success factors. And it turns out one of the big things that came out of all of this is it's not so different from what I learned in consulting. First, you have to understand the situation and do a lot of data collection to know what it is that you're getting into. What are the prevalences? What's the need? What are people eating? What are the possible solutions? What is the framework for which, in which this is all going to work around the government, around the food producers? Um, and start building something that's based on that context. Then figuring out who all the stakeholders are, in particular industry, because of how important that is in fortification. And then figuring out who in the government needs to be involved because of the law, the standards, and the monitoring. And figure out if there's a way to get to consumers. And this is actually one of the things I've learned most about and I've been spending a lot of time considering more and more lately is how do you talk to consumers in developing countries? What do you think about behavior change? How do we try to incite that? Um, and a lot of it started with the work that I did in this. So we came up with a framework at PHC about what the four areas were that we needed to get into. It was around the policy and legislation, so the big picture policy and legislation stuff around nutrition. What were the actual standards, the very specific things? What food, what micronutrient, what level? Who in the industry was going to implement that and how is that going to play out? And then how is it going to be regulated by the government? How were we going to know that everybody was doing the right thing? And so I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'll probably go fairly quickly so you can answer or ask questions, not that I haven't been talking quickly already, um, about Rwanda, which is where we started doing this. So just to set the stage, um, in 2005, this data is from a district health survey. Um, so the government had been collecting this every three to five years to understand what the nutrition situation was. And things were not very good. Um, really, really poor on protein malnutrition, big issues around vitamin A and iron, and we were still seeing goiter. So, you know, Rwanda knew that they had a problem. Um, they knew so much that they had a problem um, that they started to put some stuff in place. And they had a national nutrition plan, most countries do, um, and they, they, you know, put in nutrition into a number of their different programs. But then in 2009, President Kagame went to a rural health center and he met with a bunch of kids. And for the first time, he saw those kids with Quash and Marasmus, and he was like, what is going on here? We are Rwanda. We are like moving ahead. Everything's going great. Everybody loves us. We're the darling. We're getting so much better. We've moved out of our past, and we've got this many hungry children. And so in 2009, they started a big push, an emergency program around how they were going to deal with, um, with the main issues of protein malnutrition. All this to be said, it was really good for us, for Project Healthy Children and what we were trying to do, because while they were moving ahead on the protein malnutrition issues, we were able to sub supplement all of that with a good plan for what they should be doing on micronutrients. 
So we went out to the field and did a bunch of data collection, literally door to door, not everybody in the country, but a good sample to find out what people were eating. Um, incredibly important because people eat different things in different places and you really have to understand what they're eating and how much to get to those safe levels. Turns out that um, the cereal consumption in Rwanda is relatively high, but it's spread across a couple of different foods. So if we picked any one of them, we weren't going to get to that many. Um, the main food, the main staple food in, in Rwanda is ugali, which is made out of a cassava flour. It's like a putty. It is one of my least favorite foods on the planet, um, but it's something that most people eat every day. It's a little bit better when you put sugar in it. Um, it's known as fufu in other places. It's, um, it's this porridge, and it's, um, it's something that you could fortify, but not enough people were eating that food because it's the cassava. Some people, especially those in the north, eat a lot more maize or corn, and then people in the south eat rice which is strange because it's a tiny little country, but we found out that those, those staples were a problem. Salt, sugar, and oil? No, they're actually pretty good because most people are eating at least some of them. But you have to consider not just where people are eating, but again, because it's such a small country, where's that food coming from? So where were the control points at which we would be able to get the industry to fortify? And while there is some production, and that's what all of these little um, images are, there's also a lot of importation. And so we had to start learning a lot more about where those foods were coming from and how they were controlling the imports, which led to understanding more and more about the government structure. What was the Ministry of Health required to do? What were they involved in? Um, there are interesting organizations in almost every country known as a Bureau of Standards. They measure things and monitor things like how good is steel, what's, the, what's in the asphalt, but they also look at food and food safety. And so they were really crucial to setting the standards and putting those rules into place, and then they would be the ones that would monitor. They're also the folks that, um, that control the borders and what's coming into the borders. Not always so well, but that's their job. And then the National Institute of Statistics was involved any time you were doing any sort of data collection to verify that you were doing it correctly. So we had to have relationships with the Ministry of Health and these two other organizations, as well as at the presidential level to get things done and at their version of the Congress. The other thing we started to focus a lot more on was once we found those industries, talking to them individually to understand what it was that they were doing, how were they making their food, how were they pulling things together, and then trying to advocate that they would start to be doing it um, with a fortified perspective, and then bringing up all of those criticisms about cost and uh, monitoring, trying to alleviate some of their concerns. So the project there started in 2007, they've continued to move, move forward on it, but even in a place where we had a lot of government support, in a small country where it was pretty easy for us to see this information, it still took five years to get to a point where there was a presidential order. So, you know, data collection, understanding the situation, more of that, writing drafts of what we needed to do, trying to get people on board, advocacy, starting to pull together the functions to create what the rules and the laws would be. And then finally in 2011, we, um, we were able to pass the decree. And w only one industry right now is doing fortification there. Happened to be focused on um, complementary foods for infants um, through one particular grant. But the, the point of, of all of this is just to say, we know what needs to be done, but it's a still a complicated thing to do, even when you've got a lot of support. So that's primarily what I have to say today. Um, one last slide. Again, this is just based on wheat because um, this is as, as much as we're able to get at. Fortification programs are happening everywhere. It's something that is pretty widely accepted. Um, this is from 2010, so even more of it because Rwanda is that little country, should be blue. Um, we're seeing more and more of this this coming up, more, more places are, are, are putting them in place, and it feels like it's something that's pretty successful. But the main lesson that I learned from all of this is that um, it's really important to do that data collection. It's really important, important to understand what people need and to do it on a country by country or a, an even more local level so that you're, you're really trying to solve the problem that folks have and to do it in a con concerted effort of working with all of the different stakeholders and then focusing on all of the different ways that you can solve the problem in order to try to put the best one in place. Um, Sarah, so I'm doing it. If you want to hear more about how I think about this, I gave a controversial TED talk about um, selling condoms, which is maybe a more sexy topic about um, why you should listen to what consumers have to say. Because um, I think that that really comes into play in everything that we do around um, around global health and public health interventions. And I would encourage you that as you guys are thinking about how you get involved, that 
what you listen very hard to the people that you're trying to serve and you really understand what their problems are and what their situations are so that you're not um, assuming that you know the best ways to, to answer them because generally the people that we're trying to help often know the answers already. That's it. Thank you. I mean, I guess the question is, is there kind of an access issue in terms of the sheer volume and mass of food that people are eating that's related to, you know, all these micronutrient deficiencies? Because, I mean, I would assume that, you know, for middle and upper class people living in Rwanda, for example, you know, they're, they're eating from the same provider, and yet I would think that they would have less deficiency. So is it just a sheer access <coughs> issue in terms of the, the volume of food that they're eating? Yeah, it's not. Um, so there is a quality issue. So um, I don't have the data, but we did, do, um, we did do some studies to see who, at what social strata we were seeing the deficiencies. And um, surprisingly, the people living in the main city, Kigali, were more apt to be deficient in, um, I think it was in iron. Or no, it wasn't. It was vitamin A because they were eating less vegetables. There's a really odd thing that happens when pe with urbanization that people start eating more and more processed foods and less and less of the food that they're growing. Um, you know, we here want to eat those. We all go to the farmer's market. Like, the best thing to do is to get the freshest food. But there's this movement first to just the processed stuff. And when processed food isn't high quality, then you still end up seeing a lot of deficiency. Same point, it's both, right? So when people aren't eating enough, it's the, qua the quantity aspect, and that does still lead to the micronutrient issue. But even if you're eating enough quantity, you're still probably getting a lot of really empty calories. Do the governments have standards um, that they were, or were the companies just not following them, or why? They didn't have standards. No standards. Um, the one standard that they had in place was from 1964, and it was about salt. And if you know history of Rwanda, there was a big genocide, and so all of these records were, were broke, lost. I mean, the government buildings were just ransacked, and nobody could provide. They knew they had it, but not a single person could find me the piece of paper that talked about what that standard was. The other thing about standards is that you have to consider what changes over time. And so salt, in particular, when you have standards from the 60s, um, it was about a larger particle of salt. And salt manufacturing has improved over time. We get smaller particles of salt, and so you need a different mix of iodine. And so the standard from 64 was a higher level of PPM um, iodine than they needed to have. And so we really questioned, were we seeing all this goiter because it was a deficiency, or was it because there was too much iodine? And what, what could we do about that? How could we figure it out? The other thing is, because they might have standards or not, but because they import so much, we had to figure out what were all the standards of all the countries around them. And how do we harmonize that? Because if we have a standard and we are enforcing it, and our standard in Rwanda is different from the standard in Kenya, but Kenya's making all of the oil, why would Kenya make oil to fit the Rwandan standard? It won't. It doesn't make any sense. So is the Kenyan standard OK, or do we need to have a negotiation about what the standard should be for both? So it starts to get really complicated once you get to a regional level. Do you find it easier to go after the government or after an individual company? It seems like if you had a government policy, then the, and you actually had it enforced, it would be a lot easier to, is it, which one is easier? To but you have to do both. We started by going straight government, and we saw that it didn't work. Um, there are lots of laws that we all break all the time, even though they're on the books and they're enforced, right? How many of you speed? They're there, we all, but we all break them. Um, so you have to do both. The thing that works in the U.S. that doesn't, hasn't picked up as much in the developing world is that consumers don't advocate as much. Um, you know, the, the reason that so much has moved in the U.S. and it's voluntary is because consumers are like, no, 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 I want this in my food, this is really important. Now we're seeing the backlash, I don't want this in my food, it's not good, and we'll see what happens. But you don't see that kind of activity happen as much in the developing world, and so without that, you have to come at both things, both the industry and the government at the same time, and hope they meet in the middle. Um, they don't always. So, Amy, I have a controversial question to ask you. Go ahead. Um, so you alluded to the fact of uh, obesity being part of the malnutrition um, formula, and you alluded to the fact that industry is now on the bandwagon uh, to fortify and prevent obesity. And I had this large discussion with Derek Yak at PepsiCo, 
because of the fortification of soft drinks um, and making them healthy. And how do you control that kind of uh, unfettered industry entree into the fortification? Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, that could actually have a very um, not such a good side to it. I think the assumption in that is that people are going to drink more soda because it's fortified. Right. Right. Um, I don't know if that's true. And if it is true, if, then I, I think there are different control points. I don't think fortification has to be, has to be that control point. Um, the beauty of fortification is that we're not trying to change anyone's behavior. We're just adding things to food that you're already eating. I'm not going to make a judgment call about whether or not it's good for you to eat so much sugar, if it's good for a Rwandan to eat so much cassava. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just working within the system that I've got to try to do the best that I can within that system. And that's the, that's the approach to fortification. Now, if you want to take a higher level morality and thing... It's, healthy. it's become all of a sudden healthy, so people might eat more. That, and that depends on the marketing, and I think that should probably be monitored, you know, around what, what are appropriate things to say. Um, I think I, you know, I could make just the same argument about is, was, is it ever appropriate to have infant formula? Is infant formula ever healthy? You have very strong opinions on both sides of that argument, and they both have, um, they're both right. And it depends sort of on where you are in that argument on any given day. Um, there, it's a, there's definitely a point to it. Um, it, more than soft drinks, I think the, actu the issue that it comes up more in is vitamin A and sugar. Uh, most of the sugar in Latin America is fortified with vitamin A, and there's been a big backlash on, you know, is that the right thing to do, or are we now getting, asking people to eat more sugar? We haven't seen consumption levels change because of fortification. Um, we've never seen them change because of fortification. So I don't think it plays out that it truly happens. I, don't, I really don't think, I, don't, I haven't seen any data that people are going to drink more soda or eat more sugar because now it's called healthy. Um, if that became a problem, I think that's when the fortification people would need to, to get more involved. But this is not an issue that we can solve without industry. And so the more things that get lobbed up about how industry is bad, um, the less likely they'll be to play. And I think the less likely we'll be to solve any of the issues. Good question, though. spends the extra hundred thousand dollars for the machinery to fortify it. The other one didn't. The, edu the populace isn't educated enough to know that there's any benefit. I don't know why the companies would invest in fortification. And, and so if you didn't have the government policy forcing it down, then and make demands, I don't see why that company. Would That's why in most of the developing world, you do actually have to have the regulations. So in Rwanda, there's a presidential decree that food has to be fortified, and it's set at a level. You don't need to do that when you've got consumers that are strong. So in the U.S., it's voluntary. It's a little bit of a mix. And so most of the time when you build up these programs, you work also with consumer advocacy groups. They're not particularly strong, but it's nascent, and you have to start building that up. Um, and then you start getting a little of the consumer pull, and you've got the government pushing. And then, honestly, all of the industry leaders that I ended up talking to when I didn't offend them, um, they were like, look, I'm, you know, I'm Rwandan, I'm Malawian, I want people to be healthy. I'm not making this food so that people are unhealthy. Um, you know, you even talk to the PepsiCo guys. They're not making soda because they want us to be sick and fat, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> they, they wouldn't say that. So, you know, if you can appeal to them, particularly the smaller producers, on a this is good for your country level, and you put incentives in place to make that cost as low as possible, and you try to, you know, reduce as many of the barriers as you can, and you work with consumer organizations and you loud them as being, do, you know, doing well, you can start to, to move things. It's not a perfect system. Um, and if there was a way of making the incentives work out well, we would have gotten it done much more quickly. Um, I think I saw a TED Talk entitled Fear of Science, and uh, they spoke briefly about the vitamin A modified sweet potato. I was wondering if there's any part of the world where there's actually a widespread dissemination of genetically modified foods that are naturally producing vitamins that can, that can bypass any government or industry involvement. I don't think there's anywhere where it's bypassing government involvement. So um, Harvest Plus is the organization, and they're out of Canada, that has been moving on this in a pretty big way. The, the sweet potatoes that I know about aren't GMO, but they're by seed selection. 
So they try to, which is, you know, the complication of trying to understand those things, yeah. Um, they are getting some traction around sweet potatoes and around cassava. In all of the cases, they've had to work with government. And pretty much any time you're doing, you have an outside influence, outside science coming in, you have to have that relationship with the government. Um, or you end up in the case that, of the old Nestle, Nestle stuff, where you see somebody comes in with a product and then people rise up against it. And if you haven't worked with the government, then you end up in a pile of trouble. Um, but it's not widely done yet. Biofortification isn't something that we're seeing everywhere yet. And I think it's yet to be seen how well that'll work on outcomes. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.